There's another element here, and that is the routine of life that sometimes becomes robotic. Um, and this this is something that happens to all of us, where the days go by, and this happens to all, I mean, this, we all can relate to this. The days go by, and it's sometimes just we're on autopilot. Like, you know, we have our routines, we do what we do in the morning, we do what we do in the afternoons, and basically we can't tell one day from the next. Uh, we can't necessarily tell one week from the next, uh, to the point that we can't even remember, like on a certain holiday, like which ho which year that was, because we have to associate with something and it becomes very routine. Um, the routine of life could be very difficult for us to overcome sometimes because we need a routine. We want a routine. We want some sort of stability. But how do we uh, not let that routine limit us or prevent us from reaching even higher? So the Rambam, so we're going to quote a few texts, but then we're going to go to our parasha. The first, and, and just to give you a structure of the class we're going to ha have for the next 45 minutes, we're first going to understand the expectation from the Torah that is somewhat unrealistic. Uh, and then we're going to learn a lesson from the high priest that we talk about in this week's Torah portion. And we're going to apply his the behavior that he's expected to do and the actions that he takes to understanding how the mitzvah that the Rambam here on the screen is telling us about um, how we're supposed to perform that and how we're supposed to uh, unbind ourselves and and break free of anything from our past choices or past decisions or past um, experiences or investments. Uh, and I'm talking time, education or even money um, from preventing us from pursuing a future that we really want and really believe that we're here for. So the Rambam writes like this. In terms of this is in, in a in a section of the Rambam called Deot, which is about character traits, which is very in, interesting. It's like it's it's not always talked about clearly, but the Rambam gives a very um, specific. This is Maimonides. He gives very specific um, practices for how we should improve our character. So one of the things that he says is is that the middle path, generally speaking, the middle path is is how we should always strive. You know, you see people could become they're always they're always happy and they're, and they're and that's great. But sometimes they go overboard and sometimes they're happy in the wrong times in the wrong places. If you're happy at a funeral or if you're celebrating at a funeral when you're not supposed to be, that's not that's a misdirection of energy that should not be should not be employed by even if you're very happy. Great. But sometimes you have to hold it in or you have to understand that this is not the time and place. Uh, sometimes people are very sad and depressed. Um, and and may have a very good reason for so. But if you go to a wedding or you go to a happy occasion or you go to someone who is ha is happy and you're uh, uh, and you're projecting your your negative feelings to them, um, now there is a time and a place to to share your thoughts and negative feelings that you need to talk out to a friend. Absolutely, uh, and there's definitely times and places where you know we have to tackle um, things that might be holding us down and making us sad. But also understanding that there's not always that not every situation is the right place for that. So the Ramam tells us we have to have the middle path. And what he writes is, is that from the emotional spectrum, I'm starting on the second line, one should not be overly frivolous and laugh excessively, nor should one be sad and depressed. Rather, one should always be joyous and display a friendly continent. So basically, the Ramam is expecting us to somehow magically um, manage our emotions. I, I don't know about you, but I can't do that to the point that we should always be happy. In other words, always be in a happy, happy spirit, but at the same time, not excessively in a sense that we're irresponsible. Uh, and the same goes for being depressed. The Rama is basically asking us to become an emotional um, uh, superpower or emotional superhuman, which is very difficult. Not only that, as we know from from the famous, um, it's quoted by Renachman Brussel, but it's a famous um, idea in Judaism is that it's a mitzvah. It's a positive commandment to always be happy, which is not which might sound good, but it's not realistic because there are days and there are moments that we're just not happy. Uh, if you're able to always be happy, God bless you. Uh, but for most of us regular humans, to always be happy is is an unrealistic expectation. So now let's go on to our parsha. So let us tackle a a very interesting sacrifice that the um, the, the high the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, was commanded to uh, to bring. So here's what it says in in the in verse number thirteen. Okay, so what does it say? That Aaron, who is the high priest, um, has to offer on the day that he was anointed a tenth of an ephah. It was a flower sacrifice, a meal offering, and it was offered daily. Uh, and they shall offer half of it in the morning and half of it in the evening. Now, look at the verse for a second. This is why no verse could be read without the commentaries. 
So look at the first half of the verse where it says that on the day that they're anointed, the high when the day that the high priest is anointed, that's when they have to bring the sacrifice. But then in the second half of the verse, it says that it should be offered daily. So why not just say just say it has to be offered daily? Why, what's the indication of on the day that you are anointed? Um, if it's the day of your anointed, fine, as the high priest. But then why? Or why are we? Why is the 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 pasuk, Why is the verse being redundant by saying you have to offer it daily, with, including the day that you're anointed, which is obvious if you just say offer it daily. So that's number one. Um, and number two, the flower offering was was a very you know we don't talk about it a lot. In fact, when I prepared for this class, I had to like do some research about the flower offering because it's a, it was so it was so routine that it didn't it's not really mentioned or talked about in in the laws of the holy temple it's just something that was always done so it's interesting how the the torah is giving him this commandment but the torah wants him to ensure that it doesn't become routine so let's take a look at what the, what the torah says there and this is rashi explaining the verse this is the offering that aaron and his sons the high priest and the kohen and the ordinary priest too offered one tenth of a part of a, a, a part of an apha flower on the day that they were anointed into the priestly service the high priest now offer, offered one every day, as it is said, offered daily, half of it in the morning, half of it in the evening. And the priest among his sons that is anointed in his stead shall offer it in, um, in a statute forever. So every every Kohen would have to bring the flower offering at, when the, the day that they were anointed, but the high priest had to bring it every single day. So that's what the verse, that's, that's how Rashi simplifies and explains this verse. Uh, which to understand the law of how it's applied, because Rashi is about the simplification of understanding the Torah. So the high priest had to bring this offering every day. But the reason why it mentions the anointed is because uh, the day that they're anointed is because the regular Kohen and the regular priest would have to bring the sacrifice on the day that they were anointed. Now, the Medrash tells us something very interesting, and this is the this is going to be the punchline of our class because once again we're trying to understand how to overcome routine daily life, weekly life, um, holiday life that just becomes so routine and we're an autopilot. Number two, we're also trying to figure out how to let go of the past or not let the past inform our future decisions and not let our choices that we've made in the past or our education or our mindset or our character or the environment that we've that we've grown up in be a, be a, a setback or a, or a holdover or a binding effect in not letting us pursue what we should be pursuing in the future. So here's what the mission, the, the, the Medrash says, the Sifra. The verse states that the high priest brings the meal offering on the day that he was anointed. It is also states that they, it is offered daily. Thus, the verse means to say that he brings the meal offering every day, beginning with the day that is anointed. So the Medrash is, is kind of coming as a duh. But now Rashi is quoting them. I mean, the Medrash was written before Rashi. So, but at the same time, the Medrash doesn't answer the question. The Medrash is, is simply saying that he has to bring the offering on the day that he's anointed. And the reason why the verse says every day is because it's not just the day that he's anointed. So why tell us that it's the day that he's anointed? Why is that important from the for the verse if it has to be brought every single, every single day? So let's go further. I'm going to skip this. This is more just you know recapping what we just talked about. So now let's talk about sacrifices in general. The sacrifices in the temple uh, were broken up into two general categories. One was communal sacrifices, and one was uh, personal sacrifices. What does that mean practically? Uh, because there's there's a very big there's a very big difference. A personal sacrifice was if someone committed a sin and they wanted to a sin by accident, you know, not by, not by accident, but they it wasn't a hundred percent on purpose. So the the remedy was to bring a sacrifice where they would come and they would. Uh, they would confess their sin and they would be able to um, elevate their soul. And the idea was they're sacrificing their animalistic uh, tendencies and elevate them to unite with their soul. That was the idea of a sacrifice, but it was a personal journey in addition to the physical sacrifice that they would bring. The communal sacrifice was something that had to be done. It didn't matter who did it in a sense that like it was everyone contributed to the communal sacrifice. It should happen, but it didn't. It wasn't something that a regular person that wasn't a that wasn't working in the temple had to worry about. In other words, it had to be done. A good example of it is there are certain commandments, certain mitzvot that we that we practice today. That some of them are are a commandment on the community, and some are a commandment for the individual. So, for example, it is a community obligation to read the Torah every Shabbat. Right? It's a communal obligation. It has to happen. 
It is also a personal obligation to hear the Torah, but they're two separate things. In other words, your the, the, the obligation has to get done by the community. It has to get done, and therefore there has to be a minion, there has to be a service to read the Torah, but it doesn't um, it doesn't necessarily relate to the fact that you need to hear the Torah reading because that's a personal obligation. It's not a communal obligation. Uh, there are several other communal obligations, like there's a communal obligation to to build, um, you know, to build a school, right? That every every community should have a school. So it's mm -hmm. not a specific person, like for, it's not your personal responsibility to make sure a school is built. It's the community's responsibility. Now, you as a member of the community should help and try to ensure that the, the educational institutions are there. But it's a community obligation. And the same goes for many others. So the communal sacrifices were more a, of a general had to ha had to get done, like the prayer sacrifices that when we pray today, we're actually praying instead of the sacrifices. So every prayer, like the morning prayer, used to be a morning sacrifice. The afternoon prayer was an afternoon sacrifice. Those were communal sacrifices. So the question is, is this sacrifice of the flower that the high priest would bring, was this a communal sacrifice or a personal sacrifice? And it matters. So uh, the Bob Rennell, uh one of the great commentaries of, of the of, of Jewish law, so gives it gives a um, gives an explanation. So it is appropriate to explain the reason that the high priest, the Kohen Gadol is the high priest, uh, of why they would bring the daily sacrifice. One of the reasons was to ensure his spiritual integrity, as our sages stated, adorn yourself before you adorn others, because the high priest would represent the entire nation of Israel. So if he, if the high priest wasn't, you know, at that level, he had to bring a sacrifice to elevate himself to make sure that he was the right representative. This means one must ensure they are spiritually whole before attending to another spiritual needs. You know, make sure your mask is secure before securing others. The reason why they tell you that on the airplane is because you have about seven seconds before you pass out. So get your mask on so that you'll be useful by helping others. If you help others before you put your mask on, you're going to pass out and you're going to be useless. It's not about just, obviously, you shouldn't pass out, but you're basically approaching it from a from a uh, unworkable, unworkable order. So the idea that the high priest has to ensure that they are spiritually intact before they could represent the entire people. Um, and as much as the Kohen Gadol was the representative of the entire Jewish people, and considering that even the most righteous person occasionally sins, it's appropriate for the Kohen Gadol to constantly bring sacrifices to atone for any potential sins he might have committed. So now, the question is, does that make this sacrifice of the high priest of the Kohen Gadol a personal sacrifice or a community sacrifice? On the one hand, it's a personal sacrifice because it's the Kohen Gadol atoning for his own sins to become to become intact in order to be able to be a representative and ambassador of the of the Jewish people. But on the other hand, it's required by the community because he's a community leader. Everything he does is a community a community need, and it's a need of the community for him to be a representative. So therefore, he's doing it because the community needs him. So which which one is it? So the Rebbe explains. This is what the Sifra means. Every day was a continuation of that day that he was anointed. This is the meaning of a daily offering. It was daily in so far uh, in so far as every day was offered as the day he was anointed. So the Rebbe basically explains, and we're going to see in, in the next text, that it was a personal offering. Why was it a personal offering? Because what the different what's the difference between a personal offering and a communal offering in terms of how it's approached? So a personal offering is work that it, work that you have to do on yourself. In other words, you're like if you're a community leader, if you're a, like like a representative, or you have a responsibility. Let's say you're an educator in a community, or you're a rabbi, or a or a spiritual leader, or some kind of community leader, right? So you have your responsibilities that you have to do, uh, and and honestly, everything that you do has to be in order to ensure you're being the best community representative you can be. However. There are times that you have to look inward to make sure that you're working on yourself too, because if you're not, sooner or later, you're not going to be a worthy representative of the community. Because if you're not working on yourself to improve your character constantly and to elevate yourself, then you're not going to be at that level. So it has to be a personal journey. And what was the personal journey of the Kohen Gadol? It's that he had to treat every single day of the offering as if it was the first day he was anointed. You know, when they talk about marriage, um, and they talk about anniversaries and renewing the vows or whatever it is that we do to try and renew the love, renew the spark that, you know, of love in, in a relationship or in a marriage. So it's it's 
very similar in a sense that we don't want our marriages to become routine. We don't want our relationships to become routine. So we have to do things or we have to create scenarios or create romantic uh, situations in order for us to feel the, the spark and the excitement and the uniqueness as if it's the first day of our wedding, as if, as if it's our wedding day. And the commandment to the Kohen Gadol was you need to treat every single sacrifice that you bring, the flower sacrifice that you bring, has to be as if it's the first day, uh, as if it's the first day serving as the Kohen Gadol. Let's just understand for a second that to be a Kohen Gadol, to be a high priest, uh, it wasn't, I mean, the the prerequisite was very difficult. Um, not They didn't obviously had to be from the descendants of Aaron, but that, that wasn't just that. They had to be at a level of character and a level of, of observance and a level of, of uh, elevation that it took a lot of work. Not only that, once they started serving, you know, everything had to be perfect. Their clothing, everything that they would do, they would wear, they, they had to prepare themselves. Uh, you know, if you read the service, the prayers on Yom Kippur, it describes what the Kohen Gadol would have to do in order to enter the Holy of Holies. So can you imagine the first day of his service as the, as the high priest, what it felt like and what you know, it's basically like if someone's training for the Olympics for years and years and years, and they finally come to the day that they're that they're performing, it's massive. So that to to bring the spirit of that day into every single day is almost is impossible. So how could the Torah expect the Kohen Gadol to treat every single day as if it's the first day of his of his anointment? So the answer. This is not the answer, but this is because this is the recapping the answer we just gave. But the answer is coming. The Kohen Gadol's offering was classified as a personal one. It wasn't part of a lo one long communal uh, continuum. Rather, it was a unique experience that had to be renewed every single day, and he had to treat it as if it's his first day. I'm not going to read the second paragraph, but it's basically it's bringing out that point of treating every single day as if it's the experience of the first day. We all know that firsts are always exciting. You know, if it's our first time doing something, our first time visiting a country, our first time visiting a state, or the first time engaging in an activity that we have never done before, or what an adventure that we've never done before is very exciting. The first time uh, of anything is very, very exciting, and um, it's almost impossible to recreate it. And yet the Torah is asking the Kohen Gadol to do just that. So how is he supposed to do this? How is he supposed to accomplish um, this seemingly impossible approach? And also, how is it measured? You know, I'm, I'm, I mentioned this many times because I just use my personal life as a way to understand these things, but I run two nonprofit organizations and I'm constantly having to write up reports for these organizations and have to, um, you know, submit um, explanations of, of our progress and, and what we've accomplished, not, not just financially, but also programmatically, you know, what we're accomplishing. And one of the things that every single um, uh, donor or funder, you know, wants to see and wants to hear is measurables. How are you measuring? You might say that you're changing the world, but how are you measuring it? Where, do, where are the statistics? Where are the numbers that pro prove that you're making a difference, right? So how, not, so not just how does the high priest, how does the Kohen Gadol achieve this level of, of emotional control to treat every single day as if it's their first day on the job? And the excitement of all the preparation coming together and, and whatever else the feeling was to recreate that every single day, how is he supposed to measure if he's accomplishing that? It's a feeling. It's an emotion. So um, the Rebbe starts to answer this by saying that, number one, the first day of his service, the first thing the Kohen Gadol would have to do was the sacrifice. He couldn't do anything else before he, he um, brought this flower sacrifice. For the reasons we mentioned, because it was in to ensure that his his spiritual status was in the right place. But now, how does he draw out the spiritual energy? So now we're going to get kabbalistic. Now that now we're going to um, to draw down the lessons of of God's creation of the world as a way of understanding what the Torah's expectation of us. So. When it talks about God creating the world, the concept is what well, is ex nihilo, which is called, which in, in Kabbalah is called yesh ma'ayin, which means something from nothing. Or in sometimes it talks about ayin liyesh, nothing to something, which has a difference. Now, what is nothing? You know, in simple terms, you think uh, there's nothing, but what, what does it mean that there was nothing before the world was created? There had to be something. Like w for us, creation is taking something that's already in existence and turning it into something else. You could take uh, molecules and you could take sand and you could take everything that, 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 or you could take anything 
air and you could channel it and turn it into something else. But what does it mean nothing to something? And that's the idea, the way Kabbalah explains the idea of God creating from spirituality, pure spirituality, pure godliness into a physical existence that has its identity and has a sense of, of independence. That is the barrier, the crossover from pure spirituality, pure godliness to the identity of something that could be tangible. That's the creation. And the nothing that we're talking about is the, is the godliness and the spirituality. Now, the way God set this up, the way he created the world, was and by his design and by his choice was that he is constantly renewing the world at every second. And let's let's dive deeper into this. Nalta Rebbe gives us an introduction to this. Considering the fact that the high priest offered meal offerings every day, why does the verse say on that day? Sorry, on the day that it was he was anointed, not from the day he was anointed. Why does it say on the day he was anointed, and later in the verse it says every day, instead of saying from the day he's anointed and every you know and every day following? That would make more sense. So he explains the same question we had in the beginning, but the Alta Deb is giving us it's for the answer that we're reading this. Day refers to revelation. And the verse means to say that the spiritual revelation of the day he was anointed should be revealed every single day. So what is this idea of day? And let's ask another question. Why did God create us and create all, all living beings have this cycle of being awake and being asleep? I mean, Animals have different schedules, but every single crea creation, every animal and every human being, you need. There are, there are times that you're awake and there are times that you're asleep. You cannot be awake forever. You have to be asleep at some points in order to survive as a human being. Um, and you also have to be awake. If you're asleep and you're never waking up, then your body cannot grow, cannot function. And at some point, that's what's called a coma, which is a very bad thing or a dangerous thing. So we need to have both cycles. So what does this mean by day? So let's let's go. So in the Siddur, uh, in the prayer we say before the Shema, one of the verses that we said, we say that when God creates the world, he is constantly renewing the world every single day. In other words, his energy, the idea of creating something from nothing is not like typical creation. When you create something, when you craft something or make something or invent something, whatever it might be, it could be a, it could be like something that has never been heard of before. It could be a, a, a insane invention that you come up with you don't have to monitor it once you've invented it so you could invent a, a a computer code or you can invent a a medicine or you can invent whatever it is but once it's invented you're obviously going to want to keep on working with it and improving it but you don't have to in other words if you let hand it off to someone or you just leave it there it's going to continue to exist that's how we perceive creation and unfortunately that's how many other people see create god creation that god created the world and then he's just living up there or he's like watching from afar but in reality god is constantly creating the world every second and if he withdraws his energy from anything that's in the world it will disappear it will cease to exist and not it's not just that it will be destroyed it just will never it will as, as if it never existed before that's the idea of god's energy continuing creation but there's no, there's something different here that we have to also mention. It's not just that God creates the world every second, but God renews the energy every single day. So in addition to the fact that he's constantly creating the world, he also infuses a new energy in the world every single day. Now, that new energy is why he gives us this, why God created us in this way that we sleep and have this idea of waking up giving us that opportunity to draw in and to feel that new energy. And let's let, we're going to go into this a little bit more. So let's this is from a the fourth Chabad Rebbe, um the Rebbe Maharash, um in in his in his Hasidic discourses, which is breaking down Kabbal, you know the Kabbalistic ideas. So here's what he says. Why does this why do the sages compose the blessings to say that God renews creation every day? In other words, the, the verse that we just saw before why, what, what, it was written by the sages, but why? In reality, God renews creation every moment, a much greater miracle, every second, every millisecond. Or it, it, It's beyond that. It's God is constantly renewing the world. So why are they telling us, why are they telling us to say in the prayers that God renews creation every day and not every moment? Why did they not compose the blessings to reflect the truth? The reason is that the constant renewal of creation every moment is not plainly observable. However, as each new day dawns, we can plainly observe how creation is renewed. 
Each morning we are refreshed and we relate easily to the feeling that we are created anew. Therefore, we bless God for renewing creation each day because that is what's relatable to us. The purpose of, of prayer is not because God needs our prayer. God's doing just fine without our prayer. The purpose of our prayer is for us. It's for us to connect to God. That's why the word tefillah in Hebrew means doesn't mean prayer, which is what we use for prayer. But the word tefillah means to connect, is that we want to connect to the divine energy that God is giving us. So in order for us to, to, to somewhat draw down what God is trying to give us, we have to make it relatable. And what is relatable to us? That we wake up every morning. Now, some of us could say, oh, I'm not a morning person. I hate the mornings. And I might be among that crowd sometimes. Um, where you're not feeling great about yourself in the morning. You don't want to get out of bed or you don't want to do what you have to do. You don't want to draw in this new energy and excitement. But that's exactly what a morning is. If you're ever up before the sun the sun rises and you watch the sunrise, it's it's exciting. It's 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 pretty powerful to see how, you know, it's pure it's it's pure darkness and all of a sudden it's becoming light it's, a, it's people love to watch the sunrise over the ocean because it's it's a really really great feeling the same is for sunset but sunrise even has i think even has a greater feeling because it's the light that is coming to a sustainable level versus the light going away but either way the idea of being created anew is something that we experience whether we like it or not we have to go to sleep now we might skip a night of sleep but that's not natural it's not normal like we might do that or two nights of sleep but really, as a human being, we're conditioned to have to sleep at least something every night. And when we wake up in the morning, what is the first thing we say in the prayer book? What do we have to say? Modani, thank you, God. For get, but even before we wash our hands, we say, thank you, God, for giving back my soul. Why? Because we need to tell ourselves, our boneheaded brain that may want to go back to sleep or may want to think of this as just one long continuing and re continuous routine, we have to remind ourselves that God actually took part of our soul away while we were sleeping, cleansed it, renewed it, gave it energy, and decided to give it back to us, not because we're so great or we are, you know, we're God's chosen or any of that. No, because God needs us to do something and to fulfill his mission in the world. And that is why we say Modani the moment we awake. Because A, it reflects the essence of our soul, uh, and, and B, we have to immediately draw down that attention that we were renewed as if we were just born this morning. And forget about what happened yesterday, forget about the, the annoyances of yesterday, or the failures of yesterday, or the bad choices of yesterday. Today's a brand new day. Today's a brand new beginning. It sounds cliche, and it sounds... Um, it sounds like, oh, you know, like over positive, but the truth is that's the reality. The reality is, is we are renewing ourselves into a new day. Think of this, you know, I actually was once attending a, a class in psychology and they were saying how this, uh, the, the, the psychologist that was giving the class was, was saying how the idea that you should never go to sleep angry is such a stupid idea. Now, I'm not a psychologist, so I'm just repeating what I understood. So please do not take this as a, um, as actual psychological advice. That's my disclaimer. But they were saying that the idea that don't go to sleep angry and fight it out, like, like let's say with your spouse, fight it out and get it all settled before you go to sleep is a very stupid idea because you're in the heat of the moment. You're angry. You're passionate. You're emotional. You're not necessarily your best self at this moment. Um, and you more often than not, you're not really going to solve the problem because it's an emotional problem. And emotional problems is waiting for the emotions to subside. What should you do? Say, let's pause this fight. We'll fight about it tomorrow. Go to sleep or, you know change the scenery, go to sleep, wake up in the morning, and now that emotion that you felt last night is gone. You, I mean, depending on obviously what it was, sometimes it could be, you know, you'll, or sometimes some of us are, <laughs> will hold over grudges overnight, but more often than not, more, I'm going to mute everyone yeah. if it's okay, just to um, avoid background noise. You're welcome to unmute, unmute yourself if you have any questions. Um, but more often than not, we have that opportunity when we wake up in the morning to say, it was a stupid thing I was mad about yet last night. That, that's human nature. That's not even with any effort. I mean, maybe a little effort, but it's not like hard to let go of whatever happened last night. And the fact that it's part of our nature means that it's not that hard to tell ourselves when we say, Moda ani I am, I am, I am submitting myself and thanking you, God. Uh, for returning my soul and giving me back my my spirit in order for me to fulfill your mission in the world and fulfill what you expect me in the world is one of the most, if we actually think about what we're saying, 
we're literally uplifting ourselves out of whatever rut we may have been in uh, yesterday, the day before, or whenever it was, and giving ourselves an opportunity to start fresh. Problem is, is sometimes after we say the prayer, even if we pay attention, we go right back into our zone, and that's the challenge. And that's why we have this. Um, that's why we have this law to the Kohen Gadol in the Sweet Parsha, telling him that you actually have to work to ensure that you're getting this this new energy every single day. So once again, just to recap, God is constantly creating the universe anew. That's part of creation. And every moment, every millisecond is distinct as a new beginning. However, as a human being, God gave us the gift of feeling that new energy by giving us the cycle of sleep and waking up where we could actually tap in to this new opportunity every single day. Now, the Nebuchadnezzar brings this home in a, in a powerful way. Why were human beings created in a way that we have to sleep every night before to become refreshed for the next day? It is to emphasize the renewal in our divine service. On the one hand, we are compelled by, compelled by nature to put a pause on our Torah study before mitzvahs in order to go to sleep. You know, sometimes if you're working for a, a startup or you're working for an entrepreneur or you're working or in some cases in Torah study or, or if sometimes in Chabad as well, you know, things get so hectic that we're like looking down on anybody who says they have to go to sleep. You know, we're busy. We have so much to do. You know, we're going to be up a whole night. It's going to be all night or we bring in the caffeine. Um, but the truth is, it's part of God's de desire that we take care of ourselves. And part of that is to get a good night's sleep, because otherwise the next day is going to be a terrible day. Because we're not going to feel that renewal. We're not we're going to have that natural negativity of whatever physical ail ailment is bothering us for the lack of sleep. And it's going to prevent us from doing what we have to do. So God created us in a way that we need sleep. We need to say we have to take a pause. We need to close the books. We need to put it put a pause on whatever it is we're working on. God does not want us to work 27, 24 hours a day. He wants us to sleep in order to feel the sense of renewal that we attain by sleeping, which will infuse a sense of, of renewal, not just energy. Because energy could be throughout the day, up and down. But a sense of renewal that today is not yesterday. Um, there was once, my, my counselor always tells me this story, always used to tell me this story. Um, my camp counselor, um, when I was a kid, that basically there was once a a um, a, uh, a lecturer that had a coat that had a coachman. This is going back, you know, during the days of horse and buggies. He had a coachman that didn't speak the same language as him, so they had a hard time communicating. And one day, this lecturer was going around, and one day that they were traveling, it was a fast day, so the, you know, the. The lecturer, it was one of the Jewish fasts. The lecturer didn't prepare any food. I mean, there was food, but he didn't like make the meals that he used to make when they're traveling. So the coachman didn't eat. And the coachman wasn't sure what, like, what's going on. Uh, the next morning, uh, when, the, when the lecturer woke up the coachman, um, the coachman didn't want to get out of bed because I'm hungry. Or like, I don't want, I mean, maybe he ate the night before, but like, I don't want to fast another day. And the... Um, the lecturer finally, like with a few words that he knew in this language, he says, today is not yesterday. Um, obviously a metaphor and obviously a, a an idea that we, we can never look at yesterday as a reason or a cause or a negative um, uh, influence for what today could become. Uh, and that is something that we have to work on ourselves for. We have to put in the effort. It's not going to come out naturally, but God gives us the hints and he gives us the the, uh, the natural inclination of feeling the fact that we're being renewed. Now, there's an interesting um, impact on the laws of the blessings that we make in the morning um, in relation to this, which is part of the process of feeling this energy and feeling this, sorry, feeling this renewal. So there's a blessing that we make right after we make the blessing of washing our hands. This is after the Modani. But if you look in the prayer book, so first is the Modani, then we wash our hands and we make the blessing on Tilat Tidayim. But the first blessing we make after that is the Asher Yatsar blessing, which is basically thanking God for creating us in the ways that our physical functions could operate, specifically the, the open the, the orifices of our body. Um, and this this blessing is actually made after we go to the restroom. After we use the bathroom, we, we make this blessing whenever we use the, after we use the restroom. But in the morning, we're, it, as as it says over here in the morning, we make that blessing regardless of of if we you know use the use the, the restroom or not, because we are thanking God for as if He just created us, and if He just created us, it's just to thank you, God, for creating us as a functioning human being, which is another reminder to us that we are that we are 
brand, a brand new person. And that's why right after we make this blessing, we start with the Elokai Neshama, and we talk about the way God manifests the soul through all the levels of, of descent from God's essence all the way till it comes into our body to remind ourselves once again that this is a brand new opportunity, a brand new renewal for us to achieve this, this divine you know, aspirations and results that we're looking for. What, what's the reason for what we just read before? Every day a person is created anew. That's every day it's appropriate to recite a blessing that praises Hashem for forming human being, uh, the human being with wisdom. So that's why the morning prayers of Moda'ani and Asher Yatsar help us acknowledge the renewal and rebirth of our own lives. So, let's talk about the high priest again. How could Torah expect him to be superhuman and manage his emotions where he feels the energy and excitement of every single morning sacrifice of the flower to feel as if this is the first time, the, his first day of service? That's what the Torah expects of him. To somehow be this magical superhuman that every day... Every morning, he feels literally as if it's the first day on the job, and he has that level of excitement and energy and feelings and 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 uniqueness and happiness that goes along with it. So, the expectation of the Kohen Gadol is that if you want to represent the entire nation, you have to not just work on yourselves as the rest of the nation does, but you have to go above and beyond where these hints that we have in our prayers, not just hints, but these messages that we have in our prayers, reminding us that we are starting afresh. We were created literally last night and we woke up as a brand new human being and our soul was taken from us and given back to us and cleansed. And it's brand new and it's brand new opportunities. So take these prayers to heart and live them and feel them. Work on yourself. Yes, you're not going to get it right every single day. And that's why the the commentary, the opinion that says that he has to bring it as a sin offering, what is the sin that he's not treating today as, it's, as if it's his first day? He has to understand that he has to constantly work on himself to achieve that level of, of excitement to break the routine. But what does this mean for the rest of us? And we're not done yet, but what does this mean for, for drawing that down into ourselves? Nothing comes for free in the world. No, no nothing, no... Um, uh, benefits or or feelings or secrets or tips or mysteries are just going to magically appear and inspire us. We have to work on it. If it inspires us for free, then it's not real. It's not something that's going to last. It's not something that's sustainable. So we have to work on ourselves. And the first thing we have to do is it's not is use this knowledge that God is is giving us our soul back as a fresh new human being, and tell ourselves that if that's the case, then my choices yesterday don't matter. My my decisions yesterday don't matter. My my culture or whatever it is that's that's limiting my abilities or limiting my cho limiting my future aspirations doesn't matter because now it's fresh, and that's for every single day of our life, regardless of our age. It's hard to do, but it's doable because because the fact that the Torah commands us that means that the Torah expects it gives us the that. Torah expects us because God's giving us the energy and giving giving us the power to actually live that type of lifestyle where we treat every single day as if it's new and if, if it's as if it's fresh. Uh, it's a really powerful and happy way to live your life, and it limits the the downside of negativity that might occur where you can literally start again and start fresh. Um, I can't even tell you how crucial this is when dealing with um, with challenges or painful um, or painful. Uh, life experiences, because it doesn't mean those painful experiences are going to go away, but it gives us the opportunity to to give us a, give ourselves a chance to pursue and to perceive. Remember, we talked about perception in the beginning. We shouldn't just perceive things from the way that we're cultured to look at things, but we should be able to perceive it from from a bird's eye view or from a holistic view. That if we're able to do that, the opportunities will start opening up in front of us in ways that we can never even imagine. Now, an interesting statement from the Talmud is Rabbi Lazar. Rabbi Lazar gives a cryptic statement where he says that you should make sure to repent, make sure to return, do teshuva, make sure to you know live the life that you've always wanted to live one day before you pass away. So the obvious question is, how do you know when? How did, no, no one knows when they're going to die. It's a secret. Even King David wasn't told when he was going to die. Uh, he was told what day of the week, but he wasn't told when. He wasn't told uh, um, uh, exactly which day. So. How what should how should a person repent or return or live the life they're supposed to live on the day before they pass away? So Rabbi Lazar's message was is that you have to live every single day as if it's your last. Where this is not just this is 
I know that that this statement has been taken and used, and 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 it's it's not it's not unique to Armelazer. Arbe was the first one to say it. Where every day you have to literally treat it as today is your last opportunity to to win the game. Um, and by doing it not from a negativity, not from a negative point of view, but from a don't wait till tomorrow, don't push something off, don't procrastinate because today is a brand new day. Don't put it in your bookmarks or put it in your you know one day maybe if it's this is your purpose and this is what you want to pursue. Today is the day to make that happen. Uh, and we'll finish off with one final message here is that we always need to experience a level of advanced level of teshuva, which means the level of return and connection, which what which what's the sign of that? What is the what is the measure of that? Great joy. Remember, we talked about what's the measure measurables and how does the Kohen Gadol measure if he's treating each day as if it's as if it's his first day on the job? Great joy. If you're very happy and excited. If that feeling it has to express itself, and when you're doing that, you're able to um, uh, rub off on others as well. But you're able to really experience that renewal and hopefully pursue the the necessary mission that we are all given, the unique mission that God gives us in the world. The fact that we're alive, the fact that we the fact that we woke up this morning, the fact that God willing will wake up tomorrow morning is because God needs us in His world, and we need to perceive and to work to fulfill that mission that Hashem gave us. Let us hope we'll be able to reach that point where the mission is finished, where we could usher in the era of Mashiach and the era of perfection and the era of global peace and may it happen immediately. So let's just quickly recap. How is it possible to maintain a constant sense of joy and a sense of renewal and break the routine? Answer, when we treat each day like, like it's our last, but more importantly, we recognize the fact that God is giving us our soul and our body brand new every single day, we treat it with a new sense of purpose as if as if this is our first day. All right, the key points. The high priest, the Kohen God, brought a unique offering each day in the morning. And then there were two types of sacrifices in the temple, communal and individual. The high, the high priest, the Kohen God, sacrifice was in the latter category. It was a personal sacrifice to treat each day as if it's his first. And he was able to tap into that spiritual energy to feel like each day was his first day, which is a message to us that we have to experience that renewal that Hashem is constantly creating in the world. And he gave us our, the chance every morning to feel as if this is a new day and this is a new opportunity and not let the past um, the past hold us down or prevent us from pursuing our true potential. So we too can tap into that spiritual energy that is renewed each moment or at least each day. Thank you all very much for joining. Thanks for being a part of this Torah class. And let's hope that we should only experience happiness and joy with the reason to experience happiness and joy with the positivity and peace and happiness and health for everyone. Thank you all so much. You're welcome to unmute yourselves if you have any questions.